Um, our next speaker is Steve Lockwood, who is uh, recognized as a national expert. Um, he focuses on the intersection of transportation policy and program with uh, new technological, uh, technological systems. Um, he has over four decades of experience in research, federal policy, state and local applications. Um, he's trained as an architect, urban designer, and transportation planner. has been responsible for the planning and design of major transportation or design projects in the U.S. and overseas. Before establishing his independent consultancy, he served as a senior vice president of WSP, Parsons Brinkerhoff, for 25 years following um, his head role of highway policy at the uh, Federal Highway Administration. Over the last decade, he's focused on supporting federal and state efforts to integrate new technology and systems into the transportation agency programs, including Florida DOT. Um, here's the battery dying on this one, so I'm going to switch. So, uh, welcome, Steve. It's interesting that the color on the uh, screen is not the color uh, on my slides. I'm gonna, I think Lewis gave uh, you know, a, a very good uh, introduction and overview to a lot of the key issues. Uh, I'm going to take a slightly different angle of vision. Uh, it's focused really on the connected vehicle side of things as distinct from the autonomous side that I'll talk about a little bit more. I'm going to drill down into that. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I'll probably, in some of these slides, I probably, probably won't have time to go into depth, and I presume that, that John will give me a five-minute warning when I get towards the end. So I'm going to, I'm fascinated to see what's going to happen to the, to the colored slides. Uh, go ahead. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the terminology issue, uh, because there is a, dis as, as, as Lewis suggested, there is a distinction between connected and autonomous get folded in under the general rubric of uh, automated. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about the systems and technology that makes up connected vehicle without going into too much detail, and the functions and the services that are supported by various kinds of connections, and also who the key players are and a little bit uh, about the timing and, and, and uh, address some of the issues related to planning, both state, local, and metropolitan. Uh, that I think you'll find reinforces a lot of the things that, that uh, you already heard from. But I want to back up uh, and talk about one thing which I think is really profound and important, and it's a good way of thinking about what's going on. And, and what's happening here is traditionally with you know, manual operated uh, vehicles on fixed infrastructure, we had basically a dumb vehicle and a smart driver. In other words, all the intelligence, operational intelligence really provided uh, by the uh, driver and the infrastructure is basically fixed. So what has happened is basically with the introduction of a lot of, um, let's see, some, there was something actually written in there, um, of, of uh, new kinds of communications and infra technology and information systems and a set of third party services, service providers connected by wireless communication really changed the relationship where now the vehicle is smart, the infrastructure goes a bit from being passive as it has been historically to active, and the driver can be dumb or, or perhaps uh, even absent altogether. Um, I want to make some important distinctions, at least for my presentation, which is most of you know about ITS, Intelligent Transportation Systems, is here today uh, with dynamic message signs. Uh, grant meters, things of that nature, the state and local departments of transportation deal with. Now, autonomous, as Lewis suggested, is basically technology that's self-contained within the vehicle, does not require communicating with other vehicles, with the infrastructure, or people that are operating the systems. Connected vehicles that I'm really going to talk about is the aspect of autonomous that introduces connections outside vehicle I'm going to focus on the unique contributions uh, that tends to make. Um, the the uh, first of all for public use for public objectives there the conventions are vehicle to infrastructure connections. That means basically from your vehicle through some communications mechanism 
into a transportation management center that may be manipulating signal signs or random meters. Uh, vehicle de de device communication, which is happening already, which is means it may be a communication between you and the traffic signal uh, so that tells you what the uh, status of the signal is or allows preemption if you're in your, uh, in emergency vehicle. Uh, vehicle to vehicle communication is very important and it extends a lot of the things that Lewis was talking about that are part of autonomous technology because it allows, for example, well, uh, in, I have a Volvo uh, which allows you to set the distance between you and the next car when it's on its autopilot. And you can set the distance by number of car lengths any way you want. Most people, including myself, would choose a fairly conservative setting. And if I'm an autonomous vehicle manufacturer, I'm going to for obvious reasons, going to choose a conservative setting. And as Lewis suggested, this may, in fact, reduce the capacity of any particular lane in the highway because the vehicle spacing is further apart. But when you get vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication, it may allow you to close this up and improve the capacity. So that's, uh, I don't know what's on the bottom of the slide. Let's see. Um, well, just to say that, that, that for commercial purposes, as distinct from public it's, you might say public sector or public interest purposes, the vehicle to, to infrastructure, vehicle to cloud connection is one we're already familiar with already. It's, it's navigation uh, that we get uh, over the cell from Waze or TomTom or whatever. It's uh, traveler assurance services you get by satellite, uh, you know, crash uh, notification. It's infotainment that you get you know, from the web and the radio uh, by satellite or cell. And that already exists. Uh, this slide's probably, you probably can't see it from where you are, so I'll have to describe it a little bit, but it's, uh, it, the, the main point it makes is really the Venn diagram in the middle. Namely, we have already uh, ITS technology and systems, and we have public agencies that operate using that technology. Uh, as uh, Lewis has described, we have autonomous vehicles uh, moving forward. We're now at the so-called level two of the five levels, uh, such as I have, which in theory, as long as you keep touching the steering wheel every so often the car, and the car can see the white lines in the car head, you can't crash, that's what they say. Um, connected vehicles, we already have the beginnings of connections, obviously over cellular connections uh, to the information and navigation and that sort of thing. but. Uh, with the, with the addition of, a, of new communications, high-speed communications, and related special infrastructure, there's a set of other functions um, that get introduced. And you can see that the various degrees of overlap, uh, the various degrees of overlap, provide the, the context for new, op, uh, for new functions that are of interest to us as drivers or as commercial interests or from the point of view of public safety and mobility. Um, there is, uh, as Lewis hinted, uh, there's a, a kind of a controversy or a policy conundrum going on today uh, regarding what uh, communications technology will be used for connected vehicle functions, um, for both the V2V, vehicle-to-vehicle communication, and the vehicle-to-roadside communication. We already have cellular, as you know, but when it comes to safety functions, uh, you, you require much higher speed communication. In other words, if 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 you want to, if your car wants to know that the car in front of the car in front of you has suddenly slammed on its brakes, it doesn't want to necessarily have to wait until the car, your car immediately in front of you slams on its brakes. Well, with with V to V communication, you get that advanced notification, but you need it instantaneously in microseconds. And there's a, oh, right now there's only one technology that does that called dedicated high-speed communications. The problem is it requires special equipment in your car, and it requires special roadside infrastructure radios to make the system work. It's, it's, uh, it's expensive from the point of view of the public sector that has to invest in it. And in the pilot uh, projects around the state of Florida as well as globally, and that's a lot of the pilot experimentation is going on with this technology, uh, special radios in the car, special roadside radios that make this connection. Uh, that there's a, as, as Lewis hinted, this has been the federal preoccupation for the last 15 years uh, in connected vehicles in the public.
public sphere, while meanwhile, over the private commercial sector, vehicle manufacturers and their, and their tier one and two suppliers that are focusing on uh, the autonomous stuff, so they don't have to deal with the public sector at all. It's kind of important. If you think, if you think about the politics, if you will, or the sociology or the institutional uh, aspects of these kinds of technologies, the stuff that's in the vehicle is under the control of the individual uh, vehicle manufacturers. They don't have to pay much attention to the public sector except for certain kinds of public safety standards and regulation. Whereas when you get into connected vehicles, because there's some roadside infrastructure that's required, uh, antennas along the road, on the right of way, uh, highways and local streets, and you're getting state and local government involved, how quickly can they move, are they reliable? If you're a, a motor vehicle manufacturer, you say, hey, I just assume I'm involved if I don't have to. So that, this uh, conundrum continues today. There was going to be a mandate from the US DOT that all new cars had this special high-speed communication, and every new car that was built that everybody in the industry was expecting until about a year ago. It hasn't come forward, uh, and this has thrown things into uh, a, a certain amount of uncertainty, especially related to all the states that have been doing uh, experiments and pilot programs with connected vehicle technology, including uh, Florida, DOT, and the others in the state. I won't try and describe, uh, because you can't see the slide, exactly how it works, but you, there may be one or more onboard radio, radio transmitters, in effect, that connect the vehicle operating systems and can transmit, transmit the vehicle's location, uh, speed, vector, other operating conditions in microseconds into a network where they can be combined uh, with various kinds of algorithms and then fed back in terms of providing advice to vehicles about, gee, you want to slam your brakes on in the next three microseconds or something like that. And also radios that are connecting the car not in not through high speed but through more through cellular, either today's cellular or more advanced cellular that we keep hearing about called 5G, into the world of commercial services. And I'll talk a little bit more about those. Uh, again, starting with the I'm going to talk about these the uh, functions that are different kinds of functions that are provided by connected vehicles uniquely. Some of these functions overlap with and support or augment the things that can be done with autonomous technology, and that's an important feature. Um, the ones in the red circles that you probably can't see, forward collision warning, do not pass warning, cue warning so you don't hit cars that are uh, at a stop at you, those kind of overlap. Those are vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle functions. They overlap with a lot of things that autonomous vehicles can already do. But there are others that require roadside infrastructure, curve speed warning, uh, cooperative cruise control, traffic signal priority. So you have a mix. When it comes to safety and mobility, you have a mix. Um, at the, at the, at the, uh, another set of applications is helping age transportation agencies be more efficient with regard to knowing the conditions of the road, collecting data, operating plow trucks, operating transit. Um, at the transit side, uh, this slide we could talk about, you know, in, uh, across an afternoon. But the but the uh, connections that are provided between prospective car sharers or car users and existing car owners has has introduced a whole new range of modes. In other words, the concept of transit as a mode or a private vehicle as a mode is, is being dissolved uh, by technology, and a lot of in between options. Ride sharing, uh, ride hailing, uh, different forms of ownership that are drastically going to change what is transit. And as Lewis suggested, what in the future, what kinds of transit are really going to make sense in terms of competing against connected uh, and autonomous vehicles? Um, on the freight side, uh, there there are a couple of major applications going on right now. One is is with regard to truck operations, the platooning of trucks. Uh, through vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications and some roadside communications allows trucks to operate much more closely together, reduces uh, aerodynamic, uh, has aerodynamic benefits, uh, reduces operating costs, and some of the other features that go along with connection, <coughs> connecting the truck back into the fleet manager, there's all kinds of operational and safety benefits that flow out of the application of connected vehicles into the trucking arena, and at the port level, it's kind of writ large again, where you have communications between vehicles, between uh, units of freight uh, shipment like a container, 
uh, between the equipment on board, the entry gate, and a variety of uh, uh, logistical uh, uh, improvements that are available uh, to, to, to reduce the cost of shipping and to reduce the cost of trucking operations, overcoming some of the problems of finding truck drivers. You hear the ads on the radio where we're always looking for truck drivers. Uh, things of that nature uh, it has a potential uh, payoff. This is sort of a summary sl slide that I want to talk uh, about. One of the key things is that, is that, that con vehicle connections of the kind that I've been talking about, uh, whether it has to do with the, with the guidance and navigation, whether it has to do with, for example, a direct connection with your, uh, uh, your, your vehicle dealer about warranty information, something like that happening in real time, uh, whether it's pay-as-you-drive insurance, lower the cost of insurance if you have a highly automated vehicle, and so on. Uh, it's estimated that the benefits per vehicle per year at some point in the future, uh, when these uh, functions are fully operable, can be as much as $1,400 a year. As Lewis suggested, uh, eventually, uh, autonomous functions, self-contained within the vehicles, and connected vehicles uh, with communications connecting to traffic control devices back to traffic management centers and to other vehicles will probably merge technically at some point in the future, and we'll have, uh, you know, uh, uh, fully uh, automated vehicles that combines autonomous functions and uh, connected functions. There's a lot of speculation about how soon things are going to happen. This is my own speculation. I won't go into it much more than to say that as automation increases, if you, as you get more and more functions available to you in new cars, the ones with more will displace the ones with less over a period of time. Meanwhile, the connected vehicle functions, vehicle-to-vehicle uh, -vehicle and vehicle-to-infrastructure will, will increase at their own rate. But I think the key point is this is not something that's going to happen in the next decade probably in the next two decades from a planning point of view, that's probably uh, pretty important. Um, the, the, the ecosystem of the industries that provide uh, connected and uh, autonomous vehicle uh, functions is in a, uh, in, in a value change relationship to each other. Uh, the, 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 what, what we call the do adjacent domains, in other words, the industries that are going to directly interact uh, are shown here, and the key thing is what is the public sector role? Regulate, uh, cooperate, and hopefully ex accelerate. Um, I talked the last couple slides, just going to talk about the planning side of things. And I'm going to talk about both state level and, and uh, metropolitan and local because, they're, because the roles are quite different. From a state DOT point of view, the, the, the coming of autonomous and connected vehicles uh, emphasizes the shift in the focus from a policy and program point of view away from the history of all we do as a state DOT is build and repair roads to, hey, uh, it's much more important now to make sure what we got works most efficiently from an operational point of view. So embracing this technology allows them to play that role. They still uh, have to deal with the uncertainty about when things are going to happen. Uh, there's a lot of pilot testing uh, that is going on now nationally, uh, and there are regula regulatory issues. Uh, one of them around the choice of technologies, which I mentioned earlier. One is uh, the sharing of a limited spectrum, and there's some legal controversies with the Federal Communications uh, Commission about that. The question of information security, privacy, privacy, which we've heard a lot about uh, with Facebook in the last few weeks. Liability issues and who owns the data that's in your car? You know, right now when you buy a car that has some of these features, you don't read the fine print, but it basically says that the people who sold you the car or the manufacturer owns the information that may be produced. There's a, in, in the UK in particular, for example, there's a lot of there has been a lot of legal discussion in the passage of laws and regulations that say no, you own that information. Sounds a lot like Facebook, doesn't it? Uh, and it, it's that that just that's. In Florida, there's a lot going on. Florida's one of the most active states in connected vehicle uh, pilots and demonstrations. I won't talk about them much. I'm always, uh, it does seem interesting to me that most of them are Orlando and North for some reason. I'm not quite sure uh, why it, that, that is. Um, at the metro level, this is my last, I think it's my last slide. Uh, you heard some of this before. One is, uh, what is going to be the impact of the of, of ride healing, like Uber and Lyft today, but even more responsive, and car sharing. Uh, 
if somebody can get you the kind of vehicle you need in 10 minutes, you don't have to have an SUV. You can just take your sports car. So when you need the SUV, you call it gets there. So you don't need to own it. The other question is, is what's going to happen to travel demand? We talked about uh, volumes and uh, vehicle miles of travel are going to increase, probably after all. I live an hour and 20 minutes uh, from my office. I have to take a commuter rail, but if, I'd much rather get in my automated vehicle, sit back and read the newspaper and eat breakfast, and, and I'll move another half an hour to a better place for my boat uh, when it comes, and people will do that kind of thinking. Um, the, the concept of mobility as a service, it's a, ter it's a term that's widely used in the EU, but it has to do with, with coordinating uh, um, information about and access to the range of modes of communication. So with your cell phone, uh, you can say, I have to make a trip to XYZ, what's the cheapest or fastest place to go? You press a button and it provides you that information and may also call the a vehicle to your house to pick you up and get you into that connected trip. From the land use and urban design, we talked a little bit about whether it's going to be more metropolitan sprawl because people can move further out because of ease of driving in. What's going to happen in central areas if we don't need parking garages by uh, near every vehicle because it's not even your vehicle and it's just dropping you off. If you park remotely or may not need to park at all, we have a lot that's going to free up a lot of uh, square footage for alternative uses. Uh, if, we're, if there's a lot of drop off, going on because you're now not parking, but you've been dropped off in, in an automated and connected vehicle. There's a curb uh, space issue, that, as we now have at airports, as some of you may have noticed, but it's going to be much grander scale, and suggest some urban design uh, alternatives may be necessary. Obviously, there's going to be a lot of data uh, that's going to be produced by these connected vehicles about, about everything you want to know about vehicle transportation is now going to be available for planning or analysis purposes. And of course, to capitalize on any of this stuff, there's a problem of the capabilities in the, in the profession and in the agencies. And there's a real need for workforce development uh, with regard to uh, autonomous and connected vehicles. Uh, so I'm, I'm sorry I had to move so quickly, but I wanted to give you a little bit of feel. And maybe we'll have a, we'll have a chance to <coughs> chat about these uh, later on. <laughs> Thank you so much, Steve. Um, what we're going to do really quickly is just reload uh, Tim's presentation because I've noticed there's been some uh, formatting issues on some of the other ones. So I apologize to the first two presenters, so I figured we'll solve that problem with this one. We'll reload it. Um, I'm very excited to welcome Tim Schwann into Florida and to FAU. Uh, I've known Tim for a number of years now. Um, he is an associate professor of transport studies and director of the Transport Studies Unit at the University of Oxford. He's a fellow at St. Anne's College in Oxford and a visiting professor in human geography at the University of uh, Gothenburg. He's originally from the Netherlands and holds a PhD in human geography from Utrecht University. And he's been employed at the Transport Studies Unit since 2009 and has been the director since 2015. <coughs> Um, Tim has published widely in geography, transport studies, urban studies, and other interdisciplinary research fields. His research focuses on the geographies of mobility of people, goods, and information. One of his many research concerns uh, processes of technological and social innovation of systemic change in mobility and the contributions they can make to environmental and social sustainability. So uh, welcome Tim Schwannen. Thank you very much, John, and thank you all for, for having me here today. Um, I'll be talking a little bit about a, a series of projects we've been doing around automation in, uh, in the UK. Um, I'm not an urban planner, I'm a geographer, so you'll get much more of a social science perspective, and I think it complements the, the previous two presentations really nicely. You'll notice a small change to my title, because it originally had freight transport, but it changes into good mobility, goods mobility. And that's for the reason that I think freight transport is really about bulk transport. At least that's the way we usually use it in, in the UK. Whilst good mobility, goods mobility is a little bit broader, sort of basically about the, the, the movement of any type of goods that uh, is supposed to satisfy a human need 
all at once. So this also includes things like delivery or your your, uh, your pizza delivery who comes to you uh, at night. And really like the previous